Hansen family was living in Scarsdale, New York, in a three-bedroom house on Webster Road. As a local official put it at the time, Scarsdale was a community of achievement-oriented people, a mix of high earners and aspiring high earners. It was late 1980. The Hansons were living on a single government salary in a home that was getting crowded. Bob and Bonnie had had their fourth child, a son, earlier that year. By this time, Hansen also had a shadow employer, the GRU, Russian Military Intelligence. A year earlier, he had walked into Amtor, a front for Soviet spies, where he had made his first contact. One evening in 1980, Hansen had business to tend to. He retreated to a desk in the basement and began writing. A short time later, Bonnie ventured downstairs, startling Bob. Well, his wife finds him writing a letter and says, who are you writing a letter to? David Major worked at the FBI with Bob Hansen and has studied this case closely. And he says, "Uh, nobody. He tries to obfuscate the fact I'm not writing a letter. Bonnie was suspicious and had reason to be. Going back in his history, when he got married, he actually had an affair with another woman a week before he got married. And his wife knew that. So his wife never completely trusted him because she thought he might be, you know, trying to cheat on her. Now all of a sudden he's writing a secret letter. Who is he writing a letter to? Hansen assured her he wasn't cheating again. No, I'm not doing that. No, let me see that letter. She picks it up and so what is this? That's when he explains, look, I'm trying to keep the family together. Scarsdale is a very expensive area. The house was a very small house, but still very expensive for him. And she's not working. So he has, he's having financial problems. Between the mortgage, four kids, and private school tuition and FBI salary, only went so far. Hansen took home at least $21,000 in this period as a spy, about the same as his yearly bureau salary. That would be about $70,000 today. Not a bad side hustle. She says, I'm doing this to keep the family together. I'm, I'm conning the Russians by sending them bad information. They're paying me for it. I'm using that money to keep the family together. Tricking the Russians? That was a lie in the midst of a confession. We know some of what Hansen sold to the GRU. He revealed which Soviet spies were being watched by the FBI and that the U.S. was eavesdropping on a residential building popular with Soviet officials in the U.S. The most grave disclosure? Hansen revealed the identity of one of the most valuable Soviets spying for the U.S., Dmitry Polyakov, a major general in the GRU. Codename, Top Hat. Well, we used to refer to him as the Holy Grail. I mean, here's a guy who told us everything about the Communist Party, the relationship between the intelligence services, uh, the relationship with the government. He really was the go-to source. Hansen was not conning the Russians. He was conning his wife and selling out his country. Nevertheless, Hansen attempted to reassure Bonnie. Whatever he was doing, lying to her, shading the truth, she still felt unsettled that this was wrong. When she hears the story, she says, you can't do that. We have to go talk to someone about this. We'll go talk to the family priest, which is probably the worst person to go talk to in this issue. Because, first of all, what does he know about spying? Hansen and Bonnie went to an Opus Dei Catholic priest. And the priest, after counseling them, he says, you've got to stop doing this immediately. And what you've got to do is you've got to go in and turn yourself into the bureau. But the next day, the priest had second thoughts. Those intervening hours would prove pivotal for Hansen and everyone else he would betray. The next day, he calls back and says, no, I've changed my mind. You don't have to do that. But what you have to do is you have to return all the money you may still have, and and you've got to be ensured that you won't do this again. Hansen agreed. I'm not going to do this again. I'm going to take the money I have. I'm going to get it to Mother Teresa. You know, he's going to take money out of the family account now to do that. It's going to hurt the family. But he promised to do that. There's no record of Hansen giving money to Mother Teresa. But there was another lie shrouded in penitent words. I'm not going to do this again. 
Turns out, this was just the beginning of Robert Hansen's career as a spy. While he broke off contact with the GRU who never knew his real identity, a few years later, Hansen would reach out to the Soviets again to rekindle their affair. From CBS News, I'm Major Garrett, and this is Agent of Betrayal, The Double Life of Robert Hansen, Episode 2, Ramon Garcia. We have seen some headlines which call this the year of the spy. It says this this the was 1985. There were a series of events that, taken together, would come to be known as the year of the spy. An astonishing reminder tonight of just how much spying there is in and against the United States. It took three courtrooms today in Washington, Maryland, and Virginia just to hear the very latest spy cases. Separate cases of alleged... It was more like the years of the spy. Between 84 and 86, the FBI racked up a string of high-profile espionage cases. The FBI today arrested retired Navy officer John Walker. The charges, espionage. Ronald William Pelton was arraigned in federal court this afternoon on charges of spying for the Soviet Union. The latest accused American spy will be arraigned today in Washington. The FBI says Randy Jeffries sold government secrets to the Soviets. He got caught by making a sales pitch to an undercover FBI agent. John Fox is the FBI's in-house historian. John Walker had been spying since the 1960s. Larry Chin was found in the CIA. He had been spying for China since pretty much the creation of communist China. And there were many others. Others might be vaguely familiar. Jonathan Pollard, arrested and later convicted of spying for Israel. Ronald Pelton, busted for selling secrets to the Soviets. The arrests were a win for the Bureau. Sort of. I can understand the, the success, but, you know, of course, in, in counterintelligence, you have, always have to remember that that spy captured means you failed in the past. In other words, each arrest plugged a leak. That the leak existed in the first place, well, that was a problem. And none of that stopped Hansen. You'd think that with all the people that we arrested, it would deter people. You know why it doesn't? Because they don't think they all get caught. They all think they'll get away with it. This is David Major again. He worked alongside Hansen at the FBI in Washington. Today, he's retired from the Bureau, but still lectures on the Hansen case and counterintelligence. He loves talking about his work. It's all fun. <laughs> There's nothing in counterintelligence that's not fun. The most enjoyable of my life doing the stuff we did. By 1985, five years after Hansen's confession to his wife and priest... Hansen was made a supervisor and was living with his family back in New York. To be a supervisor in the Bureau is a big deal. In fact, one of the biggest deals you can have to be a supervisor. You run cases, you, you spend money, you, it's, it's a wonderful assignment. He finally got that assignment that he had to do to get out from under the mortgage that he collected. It's during this period when Hansen's career is going well and when spies are being taken down left and right, that Hansen decided to break his promise to Bonnie and his oath to our country again. He reestablished contact with the Soviets. Why? Well, there's speculation about it in government documents after Hansen was caught. One report surmised it could have been lack of self-esteem, desire for recognition, his belief that he could get away with it, or his obsession with espionage. He even had the same pistol as James Bond, a Walther PPK. According to the report, Hansen himself called espionage an addiction. The first time, Hansen volunteered by walking into the Amtorg building. When he reconnected with the Soviets during the Year of the Spy, Hansen raised the stakes. He wanted more money and more assurances about his security. Well, think about it. How are you going to make contact with a foreign intelligence officer? Well, you can walk into the building. Well, that has compromise. I could call the number. That's a compromise. I could walk up to an intelligence officer. That's pretty good. But then again, I don't know if that officer is under surveillance. Whatever way you initiate contact is going to come with some danger. 
But Hansen knew more than the average spy. He'd just done a study about how the FBI monitored mail to and from suspected spies and Soviet officials. He knew which addresses were monitored by the FBI and which weren't. So, he decided to write a letter to a lower-level KGB officer living in Northern Virginia. So he felt comfortable that if he wrote a letter to this man and, uh, and he wrote it to his apartment, he knew that the letter would go through because he also knew that we were not monitoring it. Inside the envelope was another marked, Do Not Open. Take this envelope, unopened, to Victor I. Cherkashin. Cherkashin was a senior KGB spy handler at the embassy, a big wheel. This letter wasn't just a casual offer. You don't write the KGB and say, hello, I'd like to sign up for your spying program. Hansen knew he'd have to show them that he was a professional and had something to offer. So this letter wasn't just a nugget. It was the whole gold mine. Hansen told the KGB it would soon receive a box of original documents detailing some of the most sensitive and secret U.S. operations. We asked one of our CBS colleagues, Ward Sloan, to read from Hansen's letter to the KGB. Please recognize for our long-term interests that there are a limited number of persons with this array of clearances. And Hansen didn't stop there. He also gave away information to prove it wasn't some kind of trick. Well, he knows that he's going to give up information that can't be provided in a double agent case. So what he chooses to do is give up the names of Russian intelligence officers who are working for us, for the West, and tells them who they are. I must warn of certain risks to my security of which you may not be aware. This is our colleague reading from Hansen's letter again. Your service has recently suffered some setbacks. I warn that Mr. Boris Yuzin, Mr. Sergei Motorin, and Mr. Valery Martinov have been recruited by our special services. Sergei Motorin and Valery Martinov were assigned to the Russian embassy in Washington. Both were relatively young and had been recruited to spy for the U.S. At FBI headquarters, Motorin and Martinov were known as m and Motorin worked in the KGB's political intelligence division. He helped the FBI identify undercover Soviets working out of the embassy in Washington. Getting Motorin to flip was tough. Motorin was a difficult recruitment. This is one guy, an FBI agent, who would meet him on a regular basis, but he wouldn't work for us. I mean, he he chased him forever, almost a year, and eventually did recruit him. Valery Martinov was a KGB officer assigned to Line X, which focused on stealing American scientific and technical innovation. Martinov was a very successful recruitment, an athletic guy, two children, gregarious. We liked him a lot. And he was a good officer, very successful in telling us what they're trying to do. Then there was Boris Yuzin. Boris Yuzin was a, an officer in the KGB who was assigned to the San Francisco office. Cool story about how he helped the U.S. The FBI gave him a camera hidden inside a cigarette lighter so he could take pictures of secret Russian documents cool until... We found out later that he had lost it in the KGB facility in San Francisco. It had fallen out of his pocket. Big hubbub at the KGB trying to figure out where the hidden camera came from. Anyhow, this first letter had all this information in it and a request for $100,000. That'd be almost $300,000 today. Hansen also enclosed instructions for future communications and a long-term espionage arrangement. Details regarding payment and future contact will be sent to you personally. My identity and actual position in the community must be left unstated to ensure my security. Most critically, the letter was unsigned. It was anonymous. As Hansen knew very well, this act of dropping a letter in the mail directly to the KGB was unusual. Typically, a would-be spy reaches out to or is approached by a foreign intelligence service or handler. In most cases, the handler knows the spy's identity and gives them instructions on how to communicate, what information to share, and the logistics of secretly exchanging information for payment. 
Hansen was different. He told the Soviets what information he had, how to get in touch with him, and where and how to exchange the goods. All while hiding his identity from his handlers. This was his unique strategy. If a Soviet decided to flip and expose Hansen, they'd have a hard time doing that without his name or job title. He wants to keep his identity as secret as possible. Now, no intelligence service wants to work with a case like that. They want to know who they're dealing with. So there's a lot of effort that's going to be made to identify who you are. The KGB would come to know Hansen only by the aliases he gave himself. B, G. Robertson, Jim Baker, and most frequently, Ramon Garcia. Garcia, spelled G-A-R-C-I-A. Many told us the CIA may have been a subtle attempt to throw off the Soviets as to his place of work. Even though the KGB didn't know who sent them this intelligence, they took it seriously. Shortly after receiving the letter, they acted on it. Yuzin, the cigarette lighter spy, was exiled to a Siberian prison for five years. He was freed shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union. m and Motorin and Martinov were both recalled to Moscow, imprisoned, and executed in 1987. It was a really sad case. Sad for me, anytime you lose one. It's like losing someone in a, in a war. And by the way, Top Hat, the general who Hansen betrayed early on, he was executed in 1988. Robert Hansen's partnership with the KGB had only just begun. I state your name. I will support and defend. This is audio of new agents taking their oath at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. The Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. When I entered in 1973 into the FBI, uh, I had goosebumps when I raised my right hand and, and, and truly meant it. Neil Gallagher worked at the FBI for 29 years. It is a big moment in your life. Your, your life is about ready to change. You really don't know much about the FBI when you enter the FBI. Gallagher rose as high as assistant director of the National Security Division, one of the top spots at the FBI. He retired from the Bureau in late 2001. He first met Robert Hansen in 1979 when they worked together in the New York field office. There's a camaraderie and trust inside the FBI, the concept of a trusted insider. Once brought into this inner circle of the FBI, you were trusted. Um, You were given a a lot of information, a lot of details, and you never, just never talked about it. Gallagher later learned the intricacies of Hansen's spycraft. One of Hansen's qualities, if you call it a quality, is he had very complex instructions to provide for his security. When Hansen approached the KGB in 1985, he told them how things were going to work. The goal was to keep himself anonymous to the Soviets, who would almost certainly want to know who he was and where he worked. To protect himself, Hansen laid out very specific truly annoyingly specific instructions for how to communicate with him. In letters, he told the Soviets where to leave packages. Our colleague again reading for Hansen. Under the corner nearest the street of the wooden footbridge located just west of the entrance of Nottoway Park. He told the Russians how to package the material. Use a green or brown plastic trash bag and trash to cover a waterproofed package. He told the Soviets how to signal a package was ready for pickup. On a fence post, one vertical mark of white adhesive tape meaning I am ready to receive your package. Your signal to me, one horizontal mark of white adhesive tape meaning drop filled. He instructed the Russians on how he'd liked to be paid. As far as the funds are concerned, I have little need or utility for more than the 100,000. 
It merely provides a difficulty since I cannot spend it, store it, or invest it easily without tripping drug money warning bells. Perhaps some diamonds has security to my children and some goodwill so that when the time comes, you will accept my senior services as a guest lecturer. Eventually, I would appreciate an escape plan. Nothing lasts forever. Andy gave the Russians a code for communicating when to deliver the goods. I will add six, you subtract six from stated months, days, and times in both directions of our future communications. It's confusing. Grab a piece of paper and a pencil. In plain English, if Hansen suggested dropping a packet of classified information on 7-7, July 7th at 7 p.m., the Soviets would know to subtract six from the month, day, and time, meaning the drop was actually to occur on 1-1, January 1st at 7 minus 6, 1 p.m. Got it? As detailed as his instructions were to the Soviets, they were so detailed to become somewhat convoluted and that they couldn't figure out when the next drop would occur and where it would occur, so they started to miss each other. In 1986, one particularly elaborate interaction between Hansen and his Soviet handlers resulted in a missed connection. In a letter... He gave them instructions to put an ad in the Washington Times. Hansen told the Soviets what to say in the ad. For sale, Dodge Diplomat, 1971, needs engine work, $1,000. He told the Soviets to include a phone number where he could leave further instructions. He gave them another number and said, call this number in an hour. Uh, That number was a payphone. The KGB told Hansen there was a package waiting for him at a drop site under a bridge. But when he got there, he couldn't find it. Irked, Hansen wrote the KGB that he never received the package and that he would be calling the payphone back in a few days. A KGB officer assigned to the embassy, Alexander Fefalov, was dispatched to the payphone. It was near the old Keen Mill Shopping Center, a low-slung strip mall next to a major intersection in northern Virginia, a busy area. That's when they connected, August 18, 1986. And the Soviets recorded the call. KGB officer Alexander Fefalov tells Hansen the car is still available. Uh, yeah, the car's still available for you. This is code for the Soviets' continued interest in their partnership with Hansen after the missed drop. Next, Fefalov explains that the KGB left Hansen's money, the papers under the wrong corner of the bridge, which is why Hansen couldn't find it. You didn't find them uh, because I put them in another corner of the paper. Uh, You shouldn't worry, everything is okay. The papers are with me now. Hansen's one-word responses were likely a tactic in case he was being recorded, which, of course, he was. Then, Fefalov tries to set up the next encounter. I believe under these circumstances, um, it's not necessary to make any changes concerning the place and the time. But of course, setting up a date to meet means a math problem. Uh, Now about the date of our meeting. I suggest that our (coughs) meeting will be, uh, will take place uh, without delay. February 13th. 1-3. 1 p.m., okay? 1-3. Yes, it is. 1 p.m. Let me see if I can do that. Hold on. Okay, yes. That was Robert Hansen. Fefalov proposed a drop February 13th at 1 p.m. Per the code established by Hansen, adding 6 to month, date, and time, the drop would happen August 19th at 7 p.m. the following day. It takes a little calculation. That should be fine. Fefalov confirms that the money 
and the adhesive tape signal will be exactly the same as before. Uh, we will confirm you that the papers are waiting for you with the same horizontal tape in the same place as we did it at the first time. Fefilov okay. asks Hansen to essentially send them a receipt, part of their usual process. Yes, sir. After you receive the papers, you will send the letter confirming it and signing it, as usual, okay? Excellent. Fefilov asks if this plan is all okay. Is, if everything is okay, I believe it should be fine, and thank you very much. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Nice job okay. for both of us. Uh, have a nice evening, sir. That's Hansen signing off with Dosvidanya, Russian for goodbye. The literal translation? Until the next meeting. Uh, have a nice evening, sir. Bye bye. Hansen's work in the intelligence division gave him access to case files of the Bureau's biggest and most secret operations. In this second period of spying, Hansen made more than half a million dollars, which would be well over a million dollars today. In our business, you walk around with this pack of uh, rocks. That's David Major again, retired FBI counterintelligence special agent. And each rock is a, is a burden secret that you got to carry around until you're dead. Well, he emptied, out my, he emptied out of the rocks because I realized most of the rocks that I was carrying around, he'd already compromised. Here's the crazy and banal part of Hansen's espionage. Hansen spent hours at the office Xerox machine, copying case files to give to the Russians. Over the course of his spying career, Hansen handed over more than 6,000 pages and 26 computer disks. Let me tell you something. There's a great myth about counterintelligence that spies will steal other people's information. Not true. A spy will give up what they have natural access to because they're smart enough to know that if they don't, it could bring down, you know, scrutiny on them. We mentioned the human cost of his espionage. The U.S. intelligence community suffered in other ways, too. It lost a raft of classified operations it was running against the Soviets, some highly technical stuff that sounds like spy fiction. One of them was VIDS, a vehicle identification system. This was a little chip that would ping trackers hidden all over the Washington and New York areas, basically an early edition Apple AirTag or a 1980s Easy Pass. Well, we had that in the Bureau before it was ever invented. And we would put these chips in cars of intelligence officers. And we would have to steal the car in the middle of the night, insert it into the car, and then monitoring it to know where he was going. And so that was a very, very secret, expensive program. We tested it. It worked like a charm, but it never caught a spy because he eventually compromised it. And another a tunnel under the Soviet diplomatic compound in Washington. Now, tunnels have been used in the spy business for a long time. The Soviet diplomatic compound sits on an elevated patch of land along a main thoroughfare. Glover Park, a well-to-do neighborhood, surrounds the campus. We're working with NSA, National Security Agency. We says, if you can get us underneath the building, we can then drill up into the cement columns and maybe put listening devices inside the building from the inside. Well, that's really James Bond kind of stuff. Think about that. You believe in living dangerously. I can see that. If the FBI could plant a device inside one of the building's steel beams, it had the potential to be an intelligence listening post. So, my God, we decided to do it. The FBI hatched a very secret and very expensive plan. They bought a three-bedroom house in the neighborhood and started digging in the basement. It was called Operation Monopoly. The house backed up to the compound's fence, but the diplomatic building sat some 200 yards away. You put a team of FBI agents who are living in the house so that they look like there's some activity, and then you go down to the basement and you began to drill underneath it that would make for a lot of dirt to move without tipping off the Russians. So how do you get it out of there? Well, you have to truck it out of there. So you bring it back up, you put it in the trucks, and then at night the trucks leave the, leave the place and they take it someplace else. 
So this is really a really highly expensive program, very deep secret. And I remember dealing with this and actually going into the tunnel. It's narrow. It's not a walk through little kind of tunnel. You know, it's kind of a, you get on a rail thing and you kind of slide down through it. Like, like you are, if you've ever been to it, like West Virginia where there's a mine. It's kind of like that. David Major told us it was a flat platform that sat on a track you could slide down. At the end of the tunnel was a small room where tech teams could operate. It took years and tens of millions of dollars to build. We did that, which is fantastic. And then Bob Hansen compromises it. All that time, money, and effort, gone. It was heartbreaking to me. There were others. Oh, were there others. For David Major, one betrayal stands above the rest. The continuity of government plan. This is the survivor program. So when we went the nuclear war, how do we survive it? And what it basically is, is there's a plan. It's in, it's in place. It's still in place today that the senior leadership of every government agency are relocated to some secret location. They're not the same locations. It could be a Piggly Wiggly in uh, Omaha, for example. It could be anything. This is where they're going to go to if we're under a potential nuclear attack. And this way that if there are did never attack, the government would survive. Very secret program. Very few at the FBI would know where these hidden sites were, but some needed to know, because if GRU or KGB agents were road tripping around a piggly wiggly in Omaha, someone needed to be on the alert that they weren't looking for borscht. They were scoping out where the president might ride out a nuclear disaster. So there's only a few people that knew this. Well, Bob Hansen knew where they were. It was a billion-dollar program. And, of course, Hansen shared this information with the Soviets. What he did when he compromised the continuity government was worth 100 moles because they had never, ever had any information on that program. And he gave it to them. We never went to nuclear war with the Soviets, but if we had, the Soviets could have taken out U.S. leadership. They could have won the Cold War. It's stunning. And I looked at, and why did you give away the continuity government program? I mean, don't you, you have your own children? what, What are you thinking? What was Hansen thinking? It's a central question of our reporting and this series. Everything that we've learned so far points to an idea that pieces of Hansen were at war with each other, split between the FBI and the KGB, an obsession with spying, domestic life with his wife and family, and something else. The voyeurism with Bonnie. Why do you do this? He says, I'm weak. He says something to the effect of, oh, I've never seen such grace and beauty in a strip club. The shy exhibitionist. The shy exhibitionist. Something that is contained in the same place, but is radically opposite, yet coexists. And that was Robin Hansen. That's next time on Agent of Betrayal, the double life of Robert Hansen. Would you rather go shopping or go aboard a Russian submarine? (laughs) (laughs) I wanted to go shopping. Thank you. This series was reported by me, Major Garrett, Arden Fari, and Sarah Cook. Our team of reporters and producers also includes Jamie Benson, Pat Milton, Jake Rosen, and Ellie Watson. Our producing partner is Neon Hum Media. Our senior producer is Odelia Rubin. Zoe Culkin is our associate producer. Original music and sound design by Hans Dale Shee. Additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. Executive producers for Agent of Betrayal are Arden Fari, Shara Morris, and me, Major Garrett. Special thanks to Mark Lima, Megan Marcus, Ingrid Cyprian Matthews, and Steve Racies of CBS News, and Jonathan Hirsch of Neon Hum Media. We welcome you to contact us at agentofbetrayal at cbsnews.com. That's agentofbetrayal at cbsnews.com. Thanks for listening.